of a very different sort of in the context of man you missed all that good stuff <laughs> yeah. but, um we also build our professional brands in the context of a very different sort of brand and that's the brand that many of us are just born with a brand that we don't build a brand that's just placed upon us a brand that tends to signal to people around us what we're expected to do, what we're allowed to do in this world. Uh, brands like young, brands like woman, brands like person of color, brands like immigrant. These are brands that we really can't do much about. It's the ontological brand. And if you missed philosophy class and you want to talk to me about ontology afterwards, <laughs> more than welcome. <laughs> but, and why do I mention this? Because I, I do want you to think as we talk about building your professional brand, just the combination of professional brand and ontological brand that we all live with. And sometimes the power that can be had in knowing how to combine those brands. What do I mean by that? I can tell you about countless times in my professional life when I have been perhaps underestimated due to a variety of brands that I just live with, that I didn't build. Woman, Latina, maybe when I was young, maybe people think I look young now, even though I'm not. <laughs> These are brands that I live with. And when the combination was just right, I was able to take advantage of people's underestimation of me and show them that I can actually perform outside of the limits of my personal brand, of the brand that I was born with. That's something that I want to leave with you and leave you thinking about as we talk about building our professional brands. But I don't want to keep you from the amazing panel that we have today. So no more from me. Let's talk about our three panelists, Amanda Lee, Rachel Gupta, and Han Hyun. I'm going to introduce them extremely briefly because, well, everyone should already know who they are. And given that this is about building brands, I want to give them to the chance to talk to you about their own brands and how they built them. Now, all three of our panelists got to where they are now distinguished, having distinguished careers. And they got to where they are by starting out as being practitioners in law firms, like a lot of us here probably, and in one case, a venture capital firm, and in another case, as in-house counsel as well. But today, Amanda, or Mandy Lee, is an independent arbitrator and principal of LML Arbitration, as well as the founder of Careers in Arbitration and Arb Balance. Rachel Gupta, is an independent mediator and arbitrator and principal of Gupta Dispute Resolutions, LLC. And Han Hyun is the head of Juice Connect, a spin-off project by Juice Mundi. Juice Connect is a professional network tailor-made for the arbitration community, focusing specifically on searching profiles and cases. So I wanna give you as much time with these stars as possible. So let's get to it. I want to start with Mandy. What does it mean to build a brand in general and in arbitration? Well, first, let me just thank ICDR YNI, Young ICSID, and ICCEF for the opportunity to speak to you all today during this fabulous New York Arbitration Week. Is everybody enjoying it? Yes. Okay, good. I've worked on into this behind the scenes and live. So when we think about the notion of a brand, our thoughts tend to wander to the corporate world. 
the world of products and advertising and revenue and mad men if you watch too much television. And that might seem a little bit cynical for professionals who in the main probably like to think of themselves as doing some good in the world, protecting the rule of law, righting wrongs, dealing with major public international law issues, and so on. Frankly, though, the sooner you learn to take a step back and look at your image objectively, the better placed you will be to engage in the dark art of brand building. So the starting point is to work out what brand you actually want to build. And in arbitration, our personal brand often becomes synonymous with our professional brand, particularly if you choose to establish a solo practice as arbitrator or counsel or both. Or if, for example, you are tasked with building your firm's arbitration practice. You are basically selling yourself. You and your skills and your story and your background represent your product. Now, it's sometimes said that our personal brand is the story that people tell about us when we're not in the room. So what would people say about you? So let's give it a try. One word, I teach by the way, so I encourage audience participation. One word that people would use to describe you. Don't be shy, one word. Outgoing, thank you, thank you very much. Outgoing, okay, anyone else? Affable. Affable, excellent. Kind. Kind, very nice, I agree. <laughs> Passionate. Professional, okay, very good. Committed. Committed, okay. So, are you a leader or a follower? An expert, a maverick, an innovator, a threat, a hard worker? A safe pair of hands, unpredictable, prone to harassing audiences at conferences. <laughs> your personal brand is how your community sees you and perceives you. It's the image that you ideally consciously choose to convey to the outside world. Although, as Gaela has explained, there are some less conscious elements that we don't have that much control over. And it has considerable value and power. It can almost be your reputation reduced to a soundbite. And after all, in a field like arbitration, where the cult of the individual is often key, selling an image of ourselves that parties, institutions, and colleagues can buy into is key to building our practices, whether that's as arbitrator or counsel. It's key to our credibility. Without a strong identity, with so much competition, we risk fading into obscurity. Now, many of us begin our careers in larger organizations. We're often initially a supporting player in the story of someone else's professional life, perhaps the partner running the case or the tribunal that we're supporting as arbitral secretary or the professor whose research we're assisting. with. Personal branding helps us to make the move from recurring guest performer to the star of the show with our name up in lights. Now, we may not like the idea that we are a brand. After all, most of us do not see ourselves in the same light as Starbucks or McDonald's or Dunkin'. <laughs> They've lost the donuts, you see. They've worked on the branding. But the cold hard truth is that if you want to build a successful personal brand, you need to take a cold hard look at yourself. And that means importing elements of corporate brand management into the management of your personal image. And the stakes are high. When you first start to develop your personal brand, it's rather like trying to persuade someone who spent their life buying Coca-Cola that they should give Pepsi a try. Why should anyone take a chance on you? What do you have to offer? What do you bring to the table? And this is where your personal branding comes into play. By being mindful of your personal brand, you can ensure that the story that you choose to tell about yourself is one that will play well with your target audience. Beware though, because branding is not just what you consciously choose to tell the world. It's also what the world concludes about you based on interactions and impressions. So when brand building, it's important to recognize that any interaction with a third party is a brand building opportunity or a chance to sabotage yourself. When we think of personal branding success stories, we tend to think of people like Oprah, you know, the one name people, or Richard Branson. These are individuals who have personality. 
they're not sanitized cookie cutter avatars pottering around the metaverse or something like that. They're human beings. They have flaws. They have opinions. So remember, although personal branding in arbitration needs to be professional, you don't need to take your personality out of the picture. There is space in this community for individuals with personalities. And in fact, deployed properly, your individuality is your biggest asset. Now, the goal, of course, is to use personal branding to carefully craft our professional image. We can take steps to ensure that our expertise is on display. We can align ourselves with those who share our values, and we can start shaping the narrative in our community rather than simply riding the waves. Personal branding allows you to become the lead in your own story rather than a supporting character. And in fact, it's as easy as P-I-E, pie. I said before I came into the room, I was gonna talk about pie. Some people thought this was something to do with my donut fetish, but no. P stands for performance. You need to perform. You need to measure up to your own claims when it comes to personal branding. You've got to do a good job. Basically, you need to perform. I stands for image. This is the branding element of your pie, what you show the world about yourself and your values. And lastly, E stands for exposure. If no one knows about you, it's difficult to make inroads in this field. So you need to find ways to secure exposure in your target markets and sectors. But be careful not to overdo it because overexposure can backfire on you. So you need all three pieces in place to bake a successful personal brand. So let's get baking. Thanks, Mandy. Now, Rachel, throughout the course of your career, what have you done to help your own personal brand and gain career opportunities? So building on, you know, first of all, that was just a phenomenal introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say, if, if I were 20, 20 years ago, I would have liked to have heard that because the reality is throughout the course of my career, I was branding myself almost unintentionally, right? So you, you need to be thoughtful about it. So what I'm about to say, I'm gonna give you kind of five categories to kind of build that image to be able to no longer be a supporting role as Mandy put it. Um, <clears throat> but this is really from hindsight analysis that these are things that in hindsight really worked for me to give me opportunities and to help you know, flourish my career. So first is skills, it's building off of this. You need to be competent, but you also need to be confident about your competency and that really cannot be understated. If you are going through the early days of your career and you are doing your thing, your work well, but you're not confident about it, people are not necessarily going to take notice. Now, I'm not saying to be bragging. I'm not saying to be obnoxious about it. But recognize when you're doing things well and pat yourself on the back and know that you give yourself the confidence to seek out additional opportunities. So you need to be confident. The second thing is that image. Really be thoughtful about what image you're putting out there. So for me, when you think about law firm days, listen, there are pros and cons. I have some great memories of my law firm days, despite you know, the hours and all the negatives. But one thing is there can be a lot of competition and there can be a lot of politics, right? I really, that's just not my personality. <laughs> it was much more to me, what's always been important is about being authentic. So it was important to me to think about how do I wanna be perceived? I wanted as an associate to be perceived as someone hardworking, someone who was capable, someone who was able to handle certain types of cases, someone who was able to work with, um, I wanted to be thought about how I work with other people, both those senior to me and those junior to me, how I manage stress. You know, all of those things, if you think about it, go into how people perceive you. Um, as I got more senior and I was in-house counsel, I wanted to be thought about how I was becoming a leader, how I was becoming a manager, how I was perceived in that respect, how law firms who were working for me, how they perceived me as a client. Um, I didn't want to be, I mean, I definitely was at times that demanding client, let's be clear, I had to be sometimes, but you, there's ways on how to do it, right? So I may have been a demanding client at times, but I actually have very strong personal relationships with the lawyers and the partners who are our main our main lawyers. And I think that says something. I still have lunch with them when I'm no longer their client. Um, so we've built and fostered really important relationships, which is another one. You have to think strategically about who is in your professional world and who's in your personal world too. 
um, who you can learn from, who you can support, not just support you. Um, all of those experiences that you're going to have with people are going to help educate you and help build your own character and your own integrity. Um, this one sounds almost silly, but it's really important to think about. Make sure you're doing work that you are that makes you happy, <laughs> that you're passionate about, that you're interested in, because that translates into the personification of your image, right? If you're miserable at work, nobody wants to work with you, right? Nobody wants to work with the old grumpy partner. Nobody wants to work with the associate who's complaining all the time. Um, you want to make sure you're doing things that you care about. And even if that means sometimes you don't have control over your cases, find passion projects, find initiatives that you care about. So when I was in-house counsel, I wasn't looking for work opportunities, right? That was kind of built in. I had that. Um, but I was looking for other things that I cared about. And one of those things was helping develop other people's careers. So when I was, you know, I had, I had tons of law firms that we worked with, it was important for me to be the client that gave associates meaningful opportunities kind of as soon as they showed any kind of capability. I didn't need a partner doing all my work. Um, and I did actually focus, I will say this, on females and minorities because there is a lack of diversity in the legal field at large and in the ADR community. And so that is also a passion project or initiative that I find very important to spend time and focus on. Um, and the last thing, well, I wanna go back to relationships first. That can change the trajectory of your career, okay? I was in-house because I, that opportunity to become in-house counsel came to me from a partner at my law firm because of a relationship that I fostered, developed. And one night, you know, doing an internal investigation, she asked me, what do you want for your career? And even though it was probably not a popular thing to say as a senior associate, I said, you know, listen, obviously if partnership comes, that's great, but I never really saw myself on partnership track. It was, I'm here now, but I never really thought that's what I wanted for my career. I always thought I'd end up in house. Three months later, she got a phone call from someone looking for a senior associate on partnership track who maybe would want to be going in-house. And it was actually right up my alley in terms of subject matter. And so she gave me that opportunity. She made the introduction. So those relationships completely transform your career. Just be mindful of who's in your life. Um, the last thing I would say in the fifth category is be mindful of your goals, right? Don't just go through the motions. Don't go through your every day. I was very intentional about the work that I sought out and I wasn't shy about asking for it. And that is sometimes very hard to do, but I switched firms so that I could get more securities and financial litigation. I joined that firm and made it known to the partners, I want this kind of work. Um, you have to prove yourself and prove that you're capable of handling things, but don't be shy about making your goals known because they're not gonna just be handed to you. People are not mind readers. They don't know what it is that you're hoping for in your career. So all of this put together builds this image of who you are and how people see you from the outside. It all goes into this exact story that Mandy built about how people on the outside are looking in at you. Um, and so you may not realize it, but every single interaction that you have for better or for worse is projecting that personification, that image your brand, your reputation into the marketplace. Um, so those are really the five kind of goal points that I would say of what I think made the difference in my career. Thanks, Rachel. And Han, what are the critical or what have been the critical drivers for your career and for you to build your own brand? So first of all, thank you for having me here and I'm very excited to speak to these very stellar profiles uh, talking about personal branding as well. And one of the first key driver for my career was that I never sacrificed on the quality of the manager that I chose. Because choosing your manager wisely is very important because this manager can either be your nightmare, if so, you should leave or not even sign the contract, or it can be your biggest supporter. And if it's your biggest supporter, it can, this person can help you to push your career very quickly and also establish or helps you building your personal brand inside the firm or inside the, the entity, but also outside the firm. 
and in my previous career, um, in my previous companies, I was lucky to um, experience this power of a very, of a very power, like experience this power of a manager who's backing you actually, because they believe in you, they, ha they have seen some talents that they have probably not seen somewhere else. And for instance, at Amazon, I received my first promotion after four months, which is not normal, but it's because I went for lunch with my manager before signing the contract. And we, we were like, we, we, we were personal fit, but also a professional fit. And if I wouldn't had him, uh, I wouldn't had someone who, who promoted my skills inside the company. And this promotion happened because he talked to the GC uh, and shared my, my skills with her. And uh, this is how I ended up um, getting this promotion, which I, in the end, took down because I left the legal field after that experience <laughs> to the Magic Capital World. <laughs> and secondly, I was very strate strategic as well on building the brand. Because as you know, there are two main components to build your brand. First is your skill set, and second is the network that you have to build or create or, or, or maintain. And I think it depends on the on where you are uh, in, in, at the stage of your career. So in the very very beginning of your career, I think it's very <laughs> crucial that you focus on your skills because. As you're young, nobody had heard, ever heard about you or even may, maybe your manager or the manager of the manager never heard about your name as well. And by building, like by accelerating your skills, you create a chance to be heard and also to be recognized. Like, um, because like your manager, as I said, if you choose wisely, he will promote you. Like he will promote to someone else. He will, he will spread the word that you're a good talent inside this firm. And because like your, 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 your skill set at this time is your business card. And once you have like moved further into in your career, meaning that you have reached your mid, mid level um, job already and you pursue, uh, you, or you want to have a leadership role, then you need to also shift your focus because now people know that you're good. So now it's time to, to create this new, new network because like in the firm, if you want a leadership in a law firm, if you want a leadership role, you need more than skills because if you're in a leadership role in a law firm, you participate in the growth of the firm's revenue. So you need a network to be able to help them to grow that revenue. And this is the, I think, this is the stage where you should start um, building this, uh, the network. And, uh, and that's why, and I just want to highlight that you really need to be very strategic like on where to focus first. As an ADR professional, what, if anything, do you do differently to market yourself and develop your practice? And the two-parter, if you could go back to the beginning of your career, knowing what you know now, would you do anything differently? Um, and I, it, you know, I started as an ADR professional, which you, you and, and Mandy certainly are, your independent arbitrators. There's, you're kind of in a different place now. Um, so in that context, take it away. So first and foremost, I market myself, which I didn't actively do as an attorney, <laughs> candidly. Um, so while I may have informally marketed myself as an attorney when I was trying to get opportunities and got to build relationships and all the things I spoke about before, now I am actually intentionally externally marketing. Um, <clears throat> so you have to come in when you decide to start your own practice. I'm already, I already have my brand, right? Whether I like it or not, I have my brand. Now it's about enhancing it. It's about getting it more advertisements. Um, but that brand is pretty much established. I now enhance it through more testimonials and more experience, et cetera. Um, but it's like moving in from a local market to now getting into Whole Foods, right? That's what I'm trying to do. Um, so the, you, I, there's formal branding. So 
I actually was very intentional before I launched my business and thinking about things like my logo, my company name, color palette. All of those things sound kind of crazy, but they're very intentional. I think very specifically about the industries that I work in and the audience that I'm targeting and things like colors and how they resonate with different industries, different cultural backgrounds. Um, so, you know, there's psychology behind this. You know, red can be leadership and power. Green can signify money. Blue signifies trust or sophistication. And so I thought about my target audience and who I'm actually trying to get my voice out to. Um, it goes into things like fonts. You know, you work in a certain industry for 20 years, you don't pay attention to how, um, you know, your, your client or your law firm's websites look like, but then you start realizing there's commonalities about um, different people in different industries, you know, whether it be IP or financial services, there are actual nuances there. Um, and those things will matter just subconsciously when your target audience looks at your website or looks at your business card um, or just sees your marketing materials. So those sorts of things were really important. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you need to figure out how to differentiate yourself. This market is very saturated. So Mandy said this before, why do they go to you? How do you stand out? Why should they select you? You need to figure out what makes you different. And so I spent a lot of time before, you know, this is not like an overnight process. You don't just decide today I'm going to launch my business and then tomorrow hang, hang up a shingle anymore. It doesn't work like that. I gave it a lot of thought about what could I bring to this marketplace. Um, and for me, that's different background. You know, the, the types of litigation I did as an attorney, I worked sometimes for a number of years in a very complex commercial space. You know, residential mortgage backed security, structured finance, those are very niche um, areas that a lot of people don't necessarily work in. Um, I was in house counsel for about a decade. Um, so I have a client perspective about how they think about dispute resolution, what they're hoping for in arbitration, why they choose arbitration versus litigation, why they mediate, what prevents them from settling in mediation, all of those different things I now bring to the table. Um, and I, the third thing is, I will say, I am a minority female. And so that means that I'm gonna to come to the table looking through a lens that is different than some other individuals who are in the marketplace. Those are three things that I'm very cognizant about. And so it's one of the things that you heard Gayla say before, certain like the minority female, I can't change that, right? There's nothing I can do about that, but I embrace it um, because I do think it makes me bring different perspective to the table. So I embrace that. Networking has changed completely now that I am actually a solo practitioner. Um, you're not going to New York Arbitration Week just for the cocktail hours, right? <clears throat> you have to be joining organizations like those that have sponsored this great event. Um, you need to not just get involved so that your name is on a roster and you just add it to your resume. You need to roll up your sleeves and actually do work. You need to take on initiatives. You need to take on projects. You need to plan panels where you're not part of them and other people are and give opportunities to others. You need to really contribute to the industry that you're a part of. Um, you need to help it grow because that is a way that you not only get visibility and meet new people, but you're giving other people opportunities. It is not a one way stream. Building a business is, I, I give just as many referrals as I get because we all have different things to offer. And I think me expanding your network and being very intentional about the words you put out there. We'll talk more about social media later, um, but that networking is really, really important. Now to your second part of your question about what I would do differently. I said before about recognizing and being honest with yourself about your goals and not being shy about asking for them or going after them. I also recognize that's easier said than done. And there were definitely times in my career where I didn't pursue certain opportunities for whatever reason, probably fear more than anything, fear of rejection, fear of disappointment, fear of overcommitment, fear of feeling like an imposter, whatever it is. So what I would say is forget about fear, kind of throw it out the window. Um, when I decided to take this leap of faith and quit my in-house counsel job and build a business on my own, uh, one of my childhood best friends gave me this little postcard that still hangs on my fridge. And it says that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And you have to take some chances. You have to step out of your comfort zone because that's the only way you're going to progress. 
That's the only way you're going to grow. And so that's the advice I would give. I learned that lesson, I think, a little too late in my career, and I wish I had learned it sooner. Thank you. So Han, do you have the answers to everything? <laughs> Meaning, what's the winning strategy to successfully create your brand? I think when you think of winning the strategy, you have to understand first, like, what do I need to create my brand? And as I mentioned before, there are these two components, your skill set and the network. I will focus here on the network. So as I said, it's a very crucial part of building this brand, especially if you want to go very far or go very high in your career. And first of all, I think you need the strategy of the strategy. So you need to know where you want to go. Uh, define the North Star of your career and then define the path to get through this North Star. Meaning, if you want to build a network that helps you to get to this North Star point, means you have an idea which kind of network you need because what on, the only network that helps you is a valuable network. And if you don't know the, the, the network you want to create, you were running around and you will be very inefficient because like if you want to i don't know get appointed in a market where you think there are not a lot of like arbitrators on the market so the competition is quite low you should get the network in this country and it doesn't make sense to go in an event that is on the other uh, part of the world and because efficiency in creating this network is very important because next to creating this network, you still have your daily business. And the, this daily business is generating billable hours. And, and the best strategy is when you don't have to sacrifice in both because you're so efficient. And generally speaking, I would say you need to create a good ratio between offline and online networking events because offline events, I would say it's, it's a very good door opener because Getting in touch with people in person is much easier than just reaching out, out to them out of the blue on LinkedIn. So most likely on LinkedIn, you won't get a message or a response. Well, in, in the even, uh, during the event, this person has no choice. They have to speak with you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not sufficient because after the event, you may never see this person again for about a year until the next event happens. So it's very important to use the relevant mm -hmm. online channel to maintain this relationship because otherwise this person will just forget about you. And if you maintain this relationship, doors will open unexpectedly. Like mm -hmm. I'm here because this door opened to me because I, I was a venture capital investor back then when I met Jeremy, our CEO, because I, we were talking about the fundraising during the series A. And I stayed in touch after this fundraising round was closed because actually, basically, I just wanted to have a warm door, like a foot in the door for the next, next fundraising round. But uh, it turned out that I got the offer to, to build this like new business inside Yusmundi. And this is the perfect example that you never know, but it's, it's good to, to keep this relationship. And but I would I would like to come back again to all these like online channels because there are so many and it's very important that you stay focused and you have to ask yourself what's the ROI of certain channels. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked about how some of the steps, some of the important parts of the recipe, but when do you bake this pie, Mandy? When <laughs> should you start building your brand? And just in the elevator on the way up, someone mentioned to me, well, you know, maybe this event, this is an event that's more for mid-levels, not for people who are early on in their career. Um, what do you say? Well, the general consensus is that it's never actually too early to begin to develop your personal brand. But there are some cautionary points of which those who are embarking on a brand building exercise who are not a solo practitioner, because if you're a solo practitioner building your own brand, obviously you've kind of got to do something or you're going to be in trouble. If you're not a solo practitioner, there are a number of points you need to be aware of if you want to avoid alienating your firm, your colleagues and other members of the arbitration community. So 
thinking about our pie, which I didn't bake, so you're all quite safe. At the beginning of your career, it's prudent to focus on the P, performance. Do a good job for your clients and your team. Develop your practical skills as an advocate and your soft skills as a human being before operating in this field. Don't try to run before you can walk. And remember that most people become an arbitrator as a second career, not immediately out of law school. You normally practice in the field for a few years, gain some experience, make some friends, and then you launch your practice as a neutral. If you become too big too early, I don't mean growing very tall, which I'm allowed to say because I'm not very tall. You risk attracting criticism and a backlash. Law firms are generally not fans of junior associates with profiles that are bigger than that of the head of the arbitration team. It's not good for team morale for one person's star to shine much brighter than the others, particularly at an early stage of your career. It can cause resentment. It can actually make it more difficult for you to build a successful personal brand in an environment that you enjoy working in. So while you must never neglect your personal brand, your personal brand, aim to build it slowly, steadily, strategically, and cautiously. I ruined the alliteration there, didn't I? That was just a <laughs> Undertake brand building alongside Network building, as Hannah's explained, and skill set building, as Rachel has emphasized, and build your brand on substance in the same way as you should be building your network based on substance. You don't connect with people by going, Hello, will you give me a job? You connect with people by finding things you have in common, finding areas in which you can work together, projects you can work together. Now, it's a good idea to focus on what you're passionate about and you should acknowledge your values, sure, but ensure that you act consistently with such values. So for example, if you're a racial diversity advocate, appearing on a panel of all white speakers is going to undermine your brand. And you need to understand that. You need to have sufficient awareness of your own values to recognize this is a risky strategy. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Now. On the flip side, it's important to recognize that becoming known for certain types of advocacy and building a brand that's strongly aligned with such advocacy may make it more difficult for you to broaden your brand. <clears throat> so I'm going to be slightly controversial now. Diversity advocates get invited to speak at events focusing on diversity. Have we noticed this in the community? People who talk about diversity get invited back. There's a lot of the same people. And you get invited to comment on and share diversity initiatives if that is part of your personal brand. But the reality is, the reality is you may find it harder to make inroads in respect of other aspects of brand building, establishing your bona fides in respect of other aspects of arbitration practice. So your personal branding strategy needs to acknowledge that there is a risk of being pigeonholed so that you can diversify when appropriate. It's all about being strategic. If you know this is a risk, you can anticipate it and you can deal with it. So you need to know it's a risk. Frankly though, there is a dark side to brand building. If you are lucky enough to get to the stage where you're seen as some sort of arbitration influencer, you will attract criticism from some quarters, whatever your brand is founded upon. And you need to be ready for that. It is an enormous privilege to be well known in this competitive field, but it's not a popularity contest. And the reality is that not everyone is going to like everything that you do. You have to live with that. So it's not always fun. So Branda, beware. <laughs> Con. So looking a bit at what you're doing now uh, at Use Connect. How does a platform like Use Connect or Use Mundi help people in their careers and build their brand? So first of all, um, for those who don't know Use Connect, so it's a professional network for arbitration. So basically I like to compare it like with the LinkedIn for arbitration. And first of all, we removed all the barriers 
for people to join. So this network is open for anyone and it's free because we want everyone who works in arbitration to join this platform. So it's made for young people, famous arbitrators, individual, um, individual um, practitioner, and, and, and by removing this first threshold, you will be able to appear in the search result next to famous arbitrators such as Gabrielle Kaufmann. And on top of that, we focus on the most relevant in this network. And this is your expertise. So our profiles, on our profiles, you can find or you can <coughs> add or you can show your entire case history. But not just this, you can also see the publications that you have been published in the past. And very important, the global reach. So our profiles are not hidden behind any paywall. And this helps you to be um, discovered anywhere, starting from Google. And also we make this content searchable so people can find your professional uh, expertise because we create like filters to make the search easier. And last but not least, your target audience is already here because I previously talked about being very efficient. So this is a network where the arbitration community is already there. So you don't like when you when you when you have a profile, it doesn't attract someone from uh, I don't know Amazon, for instance, who is not working in law. It's really attracting the people who are looking for an expertise, and your profile will be exposed to them. Thanks, Han. All right, back to you, Mandy. As you've mentioned, as we've all mentioned, and as we all know. Um, International arbitration is sexy. Everybody wants to be here, right? The field is saturated. There's a lot of competition. How do you possibly make yourself stand out in this crowd? Not just a crowd, but this crowd in particular. And what about launching a new initiative? Well, the usual recipe is make an effort to be part of the community rather than just cruising along, letting everyone else call the shots. I'm going to let other people talk about that though. From a strategic perspective, what you need to do is to develop what I refer to as a brand framework and then direct your efforts towards building the brand that emerges from your analysis. So the framework I'm going to explain here is based on one developed by a lady called Anna Lundberg. So if you're actually trying to identify and build your own brand, this is the bit where you should write something down, okay? And then you complete this for yourself. This is the homework that you take away from this session. And that I teach her, huh? <laughs> I, really I really am. But you, you've also got to go fill in your, your Use Connect profile as well, okay? So two pieces of homework, everybody. All right. So you start by asking yourself, what is my purpose? What drives you? Do you want to be an arbitrator? Do you want to build your counsel practice? Do you want to succeed on your own terms? Do you want to make the field better? Do you want to thrive in it as it stands? What is your why? And then it's time for some self-examination. What are your core values? What do you believe in? Innovation, diversity, balance, chaos. Ask yourself, <laughs> well, you know which one I believe in, don't you? Come on. <laughs> you ask yourself this question because your core values are a core part of your brand. You are your brand, so your values come along for the ride. And it's then time to review your skills. What are you good at? What can you bring to the table? Are you a masterful advocate, an inspirational teacher, a powerful speaker, change maker, a rainmaker? These are the skills that you need to showcase in your brand building. And then you identify your strengths. What are your personal strengths? And this is more about your character than anything else. It's not, I play the clarinet really, really well. It's about your character. But your character is as much a part of your brand as your skill set because you're selling yourself, remember? That's what you've got to sell. And because this, for, this field really likes its credentials, what makes you credible? What is your experience? Where and how have you showcased your skills? Why should the arbitration community take you seriously and you can also undertake some risk analysis are there any gaps in your knowledge do you need to add to your credentials do you need to 
you know, polish that halo? How do your skills and values align with those of others in the market? Do you have any weaknesses that you need to address? It's all getting a bit existential really, isn't it? And last but not least, ask yourself, what tools do I have at my disposal that will help me to deliver on my brand's potential? Whether that's social media, and let's face it, you need to know how to use social media in this day and age. Do you get enough speaking opportunities? Do you need to know how to create your own speaking opportunities? Frankly, if you need to do that, you can ask me. I can tell you how to do it. I've done it. Not this one, I hasten to add. They invited me. I promise <laughs> I didn't just turn off. And they're like, hey, you know me, right? Can I join this one? Do you have a personal website? Do you have a personal blog? Do you have something else? Write all of those things down and you take all of that information you distill it and you use it to identify what your brand actually is and how you can best describe yourself as a professional. And then when you're presented with a professional or a personal opportunity, you consult your framework. It's a bit like your vision board. And you decide, is this opportunity consistent with and will it enhance my brand or is it going to risk undermining all of my hard work? Simple, right? Yeah, you can all go and do that now. <laughs> all right, so do you launch a new initiative? If that's not exciting enough for you, should you launch a new initiative? Well, when it comes to branding, the strongest brands are often the brands that offer their audience something that they didn't actually realize they needed. With Careers in Arbitration, which is my brand, has anybody heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> a, couple of I, a couple of people in the back, I, I got it. Okay, that's good. Careers and Arbitration is about three years old now. It's got 52,000 followers from across the globe, ranging from very junior community members who are at the beginning of their career journeys to very senior practitioners who've scaled the heights of the field. It is a brand and a tool for everyone, not just aspiring practitioners. Now, 52,000 followers, by way of contrast, in this field, that's more followers than ICSID, ICDR, the American Arbitration Association, NIAC, Arbitral Women, Global Arbitration Review, and numerous GAR 100 firms. You think you can't use social media to build a brand from nothing? You can. Believe me, I've done it. How did I do it? The biggest challenge was identifying a need. I built a brand based on the rather simple idea that people would find it useful if stuff about arbitration careers was all in one place rather than scattered around the internet. That's not a difficult concept, is it? That's a simple idea. But it was something that would make life easier for thousands of aspiring arbitration practitioners, and so there was potential. And once I'd done that, I needed to create a brand identity. So what do you Google if you're interested in a career in arbitration? Well, it's probably gonna be something like careers in arbitration. And <laughs> so that became the name, honestly. It's this simple, seriously. And then came the tough part, building brand identity and awareness. What do we stand for? What would we offer? What were our strengths? And perhaps most importantly, where would we get our content from? And how would we ensure that we didn't let down the people who started to rely on the feed for information? Now, barring global pandemics, there will always be a stream of current content to share in the form of new vacancies. But frankly, nobody actually wants to engage with a vacancy because nobody wants to advertise that they're looking for a job. Nobody wants to alert their competition to the existence of their dream role. So I have created a social media feed with no incentive to engage with any of the posts. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> so we had to put some content on the feed that was not just stuff nobody wanted to admit they were looking at. And so we repurposed content. We used content that already existed. I am that lazy, folks. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, how am I going to get insights about careers in arbitration? I'm going to use the stuff on the internet. Hurrah. I know how to do a Google search. <laughs> so I identified years of long forgotten interviews and videos featuring arbitration practitioners sharing their insights about career development to drive engagement with the feed. We used what already existed, we brought it back, we gave it a new lease of life, and as a result, I was able to build the platform quickly. As for whether it's worth doing, 
tell me if you think it was worth me doing it. So that's, that's a matter for you. I've started the process of doing it all again with two new brands because I don't have enough to do. And well, neither brand is likely to reach quite the same heights because there's only so many ideas that are that simple. Each presents an opportunity for me to bring something new to the table. And just in case you all think I'm bragging, there are a very large proportion of the 52,000 people who have absolutely no idea that I'm the person behind careers in arbitration. I get messages like, dear sir, <laughs> <laughs> obviously it had to be a boy behind the feed, didn't it? I mean, couldn't be anyone else. So I don't actually use it to advertise myself because I see that as being tacky. Careers in arbitration is not about me as an arbitrator. It's fantastic that it's given me a platform to talk about the things that matter to me, to promote the initiatives that matter to me and to share opportunities. But it's not actually about me, it's a community initiative and it's about the community. It's a tool for the community to use. So should you start an initiative? Well, if you have the time, the energy and the commitment, it can be a great addition to your personal branding arsenal, but you have to keep it going or have an exit strategy. Otherwise your initiative's brand starts to wither on the vine and your personal brand may be collateral damage because you are then the person associated with the very big failing feed. So proceed with caution. Thanks, Mandy. Now we've certainly been touching on the subject of social media. Clearly social media has a lot to do uh, with building your brand these days. So Rachel, how, if at all, do you use social media in your marketing? And do you think it makes a difference? And talking about the dark side of building your brand, are there pros and cons to social media in connection, particularly with, with your ADR practice? So I think social media is kind of a necessary evil. Um, and I strategically use that, that phrase. You have to use social media nowadays. And so I am very active on LinkedIn. I am not a natural marketer, right? I'm an attorney at you know, my original trade. And now I am a mediator and arbitrator. Marketing is not something that comes naturally. And you've heard us all talk about your brand is you, your self-marketing, that's really uncomfortable um, for, for pretty much everyone, I think. Um, <clears throat> I have become very intentional about my LinkedIn. Um, it is a way of just connecting you to the world um, and this entire industry but it's also a way to kind of provide opportunities as, as Mandy's doing to others. So it's a way of learning, it's a way of growing, and it's a way of marketing. Um, what I would say is for me, it's, you know, the initiative that I've kind of taken on is, is much smaller scale. I do a lot of mediation work in addition to arbitration. And I have found that one of my kind of initiatives is trying to help um, make attorneys be more effective advocates in dispute resolution processes, mediation and arbitration. Um, and so really what I am very targeted on in my LinkedIn is again, who's my audience, um, my clients, uh, potential clients, but it's also things like diversity. It's also things about empowerment. It's also things like educating and training advocates. Um, and so I have to use it. I will say that the pros and cons of this, you have to, uh, you've heard this said, you need to be strategic and cognizant about the voice that you're putting out there because in one post, you can undermine your entire brand. Um, and so a while back, I actually had hired um, someone to a marketing company to try to take over my LinkedIn because it can be a massive amount of time that you're spending. And you also have, you know, this whole business and practice that you're trying to do. Um, so marketing can become a full-time job. I learned very quickly that having somebody like outsourcing my LinkedIn wasn't going to work for me because it wasn't authentic. Um, the content that they were sourcing and I was approving everything, or actually most time I was disproving the things that they're bringing to me because it didn't feel authentic to my voice. It didn't feel consistent with my brand. It didn't cons feel consistent with the messaging that I wanted out there to my audience, um, to my target clients. Um, and so the cons are, if you are not, if like someone had once said to me, just post to post, you need to be present. And candidly, I thought that was the worst piece of advice that I could have been given. 
because you don't want to do that. You don't want to just be someone who's just every day putting something on LinkedIn that has no consistency. It has no constant message. It's not targeting anything. And we talked a bit about networking and that's a whole different um, conversation of talking about like how to look at your network efficiently as, as the phrase was used to make sure that your network, you know, where are your holes? Where are the networks? Like, who are they targeting? Are you getting involved in an audience that's actually not going to serve any purpose because it's not going to lead to opportunities that you want to be building. Um, LinkedIn is all about that. It is, you know, making sure that you are consistently using your brand and your voice in a way that's going to be helpful to you and to others or whatever you're passionate about. So, but the other thing is as an arbitrator, especially like I have disclosures on every case. Um, a standard social media disclosure. I do not know who all my followings, followers are, right? I could not name the people who like my posts or who have connected with me. So I need to make sure that I actually have a standard disclosure about that. There was the one that the short period of time that somebody was managing my LinkedIn, they were also targeting um, invitations to, to people that they thought were my target audience. And, you know, in LinkedIn, you get the emails, you, so-and-so is now your connection. And one day I saw someone pop up um, and she, the, the person also had like a standard response when somebody accepted my LinkedIn connection. Thank you for accepting, it was just a very standard email. I saw something pop up in my email and I recognized the name immediately. I had just done a disclosure for a new case and that was one of the lead uh, attorneys for one of the parties. And so I immediately emailed the, the vendor and was like, do not send that acceptance um, email, that standard email because that like was going to be really problematic. So I started drafting like a disclosure, supplemental disclosure to have to submit to the parties to basically say, you know, a third party is now connected on LinkedIn in the last few days, but the case settled. So I actually didn't, it didn't become a problem, but one of the kind of cons or issues, you need to be very mindful if you're active on LinkedIn and who you're connecting with, because if you're sending a message to someone who is, um, an attorney on one of your cases, that's problematic, right? Um, so that's where I say it's a necessary evil. You can't just be frivolous with it. You have to be very strategic and mindful about what you're doing on it. All right, we have arrived at part of our panel that I like to call Chuck, Date, or Love. I have three questions to pose to our panelists. Uh, and their answers have to be those three, one of those three words. Chuck means don't like it. I don't like this idea. Date means, you know, might flirt with it, maybe. I don't know, try it out. Or love, you know, you love this idea. You're very committed to it. Okay, so here goes. Uh, the idea is we should never again have women in international arbitration or diversity in international arbitration panels. Simply organize and promote panels of substance that happen to be majority women and persons of color. Huh, check, date, or love. Not that easy, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say Chuck. Okay. All right, Mandy. I'm going to be commitment phobic and say date. Okay. <laughs> Rachel. I'm going to be even more commitment phobic and say theoretically love, realistically, mm -hmm. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's it hard. <laughs> it's the equivalent of it depends, I think. It's the last lawyer answer. Okay. Um, Oh, and I just wanted to make a comment about kind of building your brand and, and, and kind of like sitting down with a piece of paper and, and talking about your skills. And, and I just thought that if there's, if there are any D and D nerds out there, this is you, you know, you just get your 20 sided die and start figuring out your strengths, your hit points. <coughs> are you chaotic good? Are you chaotic neutral? Anyway. I just out I'm, myself as a major geek. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this is something that happened during the pandemic in my family, lots of D&D. &D. Um, but in any event, next question. How about, consider changing the way you speak or the way you dress in order to conform, to conform your brand 
to popular accepted norms. Mandy. Now, this is difficult for me because I'm bi-dialectal. So when I speak to a US audience, I have a mid-Atlantic accent. When I speak to an English audience, I have an English accent. So I actually do change the way in which I sound, but I don't think you should have to. Like a voice coach, for instance, to lower your voice to make you sound more. Or I can do that Things as well. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I used to sing as well. I can sing musical theater, so I guess me. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not answering the question, am I? date, <laughs> love. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna date again. I'm, com I'm confirming okay. my commitment. Okay. Rachel? Shock, be authentic. Just try to be who you are. And I'm not saying that when you're in different circumstances, you may conform a little differently. That isn't being authentic. It is. But consciously changing to try to conform something to an accepted norm, I chuck that. I'm thinking right. cultural issues, partly. Yes. That's, that's partly that's, why I'm that's saying. Fair. That's partly why well, I'm saying. That's okay. perfectly fair. Speaking yeah. to a woman yes. whose name can be and is meant to be pronounced in two different ways. So totally understand. Huh. For me, definitely Chuck, because being me helped me where I am at, at the moment, actually. All right. And last rapid fire question. Holding each other up instead of leaning in when you're creating your brand in a competitive market. Uh, Rachel. Love, love, love. <laughs> Even I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. <laughs> All right, well, there you have it. Um, and I don't know, Luis, do, do we have time for questions? Yes, we do. It was 7.15, we told the organizers. Is that all right? I don't know if you have any questions on the app. Um, I had one, but it's already been answered. It was uh, about uh, careers in arbitration, so. Was it a good uh, question? Should it, I be, should it, I be it was, concerned? <laughs> it was uh, what motivated you to start careers in arbitration? I think I think it. I, I said enough. Answer. I think on the topic. So, <laughs> uh, but so I will open it up to anyone online or here to ask any other questions of our amazing panelists. I've been picking on you. You must have some questions. Yeah. Can I go? Yes. All right. Um, thank you very much for the panel for. Presentation. I'd say it was very philosophical in terms of reflection and thinking about the issues raised. Uh, my question is, oftentimes you hear that you need to be a good arbitration practitioner or an arbitrator, as this might be, you should be a good litigator. So traditionally we've seen litigation uh, practitioners pull into the arbitration fair and they perform very well, right? And that seems to be the conventional wisdom, but I don't think that's that's valid these days because we see people that are not very, I think you probably have even lawyers that are probably in the corporate world So what's your perspective on this? And uh, you say going into the future that young or aspiring practitioners and educators should probably watch towards the equipment in each in a particular area before bearing us into like a more robust arbitration practice as an arbitrator. I have my own very strong opinion of this, but I will open it up to the panel. Anyone want to answer? The floor to you. I'm not an arbitration practitioner. Rachel, um, first. Um, sure. I would say you know it's it's mixed. I mean, I think um, you know from my personal experience, having the litigation background has been helpful because for me, it taught me. Um, Kind of this, the, the understanding of the process, the, the value that arbitration brings versus litigation. Um, but I actually think to some extent my client experience, and so that's not my client experience, I was very much a litigator, but I wasn't in court. So it's a little different, right? So when I was in house counsel, I wasn't the face in court doing advocacy, arguing to judges. I was more strategy and client approval. Um, and I actually think at the end of the day, that influences me as an arbitrator and as a practitioner even more than my litigation days, um, because I understand kind of the practicalities from the business side, from the client side, the economics, which practical in terms of um, disclosure and e-discovery. So like when I was outside counsel at a law firm, I would make demands on my clients about how to collect documents or how to answer interrogatories. And then when you're actually at a company and you realize like what it takes to find that information and who has it and find the right person, it's a whole different perspective. So 
it is a lawyer answer to say to you, I don't think you need necessarily to spend your entire career as a litigator, but I do think you need to understand um, enough of the process and um, know how to advocate. If you're going to be a, a, an arbitration advocate, you need to understand the advocacy skills. That's not, that's not necessarily the same as litigation skills. Um, but I think if you've worked on kind of just mergers and acquisitions and then decide to just jump into the arbitration world, I think it might be a steep kind of learning curve. I'm a litigator. If you, if you ask me what I do for a living, I will tell you, other than being an arbitrator, I will tell you I'm a litigator. My background is in litigation. I cut my teeth in litigation. I ended up practicing arbitration because an arbitration ended up on my desk. I am not one of these people, like so many young people today, who is like, I want to be an arbitration lawyer. This is my <laughs> life's dream. And I love that drive. I love that passion. It wasn't me. So, you know, people say, well, how did you get into arbitration? I said, well, it just happened. So I wanted to be a litigator. I enjoy litigation. I like the chess game. I like the opportunities that you get. The, the part of my practice that I love the most is Privy Council appellate work. So I do very, very high level appeal work before our UK Supreme Court judges, which, and that's the bit that I really, really love. I mean, I love, I love arbitration, but that's what I really love. So from my perspective, there is a lot to take from litigation. There is a lot that you can learn from being in the trenches and practicing in that way. So I wouldn't change things. And I still practice litigation to this day, so. Yeah, and with respect to, to my personal opinion, it's, it is very close to Mandy's. I grew up as a litigator um, when I, all the way back when I was in law school, uh, yes, I mean, commercial, international commercial arbitration was a thing, but it really wasn't talked about that much. And investment arbitration was barely a twinkle in people's eye. Um, so I started my career as a litigator. I wanted to be a litigator. Um, I worked at Paul Weiss, so that will give you an idea of how much I wanted to be a litigator. And that was my training. And frankly, when I first got into the field of investment arbitration in the early 2000s, when it was really starting to kick off, I was, I won't say less than impressed, but I was a bit frustrated by the types of arbitrators we would get back then because they didn't tend to be litigators and they didn't tend to have the background that one really needs to decide these complex issues. So, you know, again, very personal opinion and it, it would probably go against my self-interest to say anything otherwise. But I just think that litigators have certain a certain skill set skill set that transactional attorneys might lack when it comes to arbitration because it is it it is a sort of litigation that's what it is. Um, and I have a question. Uh, Oh, um, someone's just saying. Like, could you? Someone's just saying. Could you put the website of the organization? Um, I think maybe Han had mentioned. Um, uh, we'll we'll try to do that. Um, and then, how do mentoring and fellowship work for growing your personal br brand for Latinos, and uh, specifically? Um, wow. Well. <laughs> Um, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe this is pointed at me. Um, I, I certainly, I, I, I think that a lot of people in my life can attest that I am out there all the time mentoring um, other fellow Latinx folks. Um, I very purposefully create a lot of programming on um, on diversity initiatives and and i'm absolutely mindful of kind of the dark side of that and being pigeonholed as a diversity person that said um i think i have really put the gas pedal on those sorts of programs and initiatives and mentoring once i got to a place of power so that i wasn't 
you know, so I wasn't pigeonholed as that. So people did know me as a substantive advocate. So people did know me as this attorney that won all of her arbitrations. Um, so they couldn't just pigeonhole me as some sort of um, diversity, as you said, put me in the diversity friend zone, essentially. Like, oh, she's so nice. And she talks about diversity all the time, but God knows if she knows anything about international arbitration. Um, so, you know, that was very calculated on my part. I have always been very, very vocal about it. But, but like I said, I've, I, I've definitely put the gas on recently. I do think it very much helps. I think it helps a lot of people build their brands. And I also think that building your brand, especially within a community, if you're helping each other, that can, that can kind of maybe help deflect the whole diversity friend zone thing. Um, that, that's um, my, my answer to how to build a brand within or for Latinos. Yes. I, I have a question. So this dichotomy between tradition and innovation is, is quite interesting. And I think it comes up in a lot of the things you've mentioned. Uh, but I was, I was curious, so several of you have sort of taken that leap of faith, stepping into the unknown. Um, what if someone, a young practitioner, has an idea, an interesting idea for an initiative? Uh, what, what sort of tips and recommendations would you have for them? You know, finding sounding boards or speaking to someone senior, but then you're always afraid that they'll steal your idea. I don't know, what would what, what work for you? Uh, and what would you recommend for someone that's considering uh, starting a new initiative or a new brand? Andy, you want to? <laughs> uh, first, I'd say, come and talk to me. I'm not going to steal your idea. I don't need it. I have one every two weeks, approximately. I've got so many ideas sitting on the back burner. I, I've become a complete nightmare to my friends, frankly. They're like, stop, stop. No more initiatives. Don't be smart. Don't be fine. Just like that. Yeah. Um, so talk to people. Do some research. So identify people that you trust who you think can take this journey with you. I don't recommend commencing a new initiative on your own. I am, you know, my initiatives tend to be things I do largely on my own, although my, my new baby, our balance, which is actually careers in arbitrations baby, is something I will be doing with other people. It's just the other people aren't visible yet, only I am visible. Makes me sound a bit mean, doesn't it really? But it's not because I don't like them, it's because I want to give them a good spotlight. So, so find people that you trust, work with people that you trust, sense test your idea, and don't underestimate the amount of time that will be required to make it work. Whatever estimate you have in your head, quadruple it. Because for every initiative, there's a learning curve and things will go wrong. I mean, when I launched Careers in Arbitration, I had a bet with one of my friends, Mercy McBrayer at the Chartered mm -hmm. Institute of Arbitrators. And I just, I was like, I'm gonna soft launch this thing. You can soft launch things as well. I'm, like, I'm gonna soft launch my idea on the internet. It's gonna be exciting. And, and I was like, oh, imposter syndrome. I'm not gonna get any likes. You know, like three, you know, there's always like three people who like everything I post, regardless of what it is, because they're nice. We like those people. They're my friends. And other than my three friends, possibly a relative, that sort of thing, you know, a couple of, couple of people I teach, that sort of thing. I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to get anyone else. And, and Mercy was like, this is going to take off. You're going to get like, you know, you're going to get like at least 50 likes. I was like, all right, you know, usual stakes usual steaks involve baking. So I ended up having to bake her a lot of chocolate shortbread cookies <laughs> is the end of the story, basically. <laughs> so the, the problem with your own initiative, if you don't have somebody to use as a sounding board is you might talk yourself out of it before it actually happens. And I almost did. Careers in arbitration took forever to, to become a thing. The only reason it exists is because I had lunch with my friend, David Phillips, who's a King's Council now. I haven't got used to King's Council yet. <laughs> Anybody got used to King's Council? <laughs> Unsettling stuff. And David and I had lunch and I said, and, and I was like, David, this is my idea. David's English. He sounds like Prince Charles. So I used my, <laughs> the, the English version of the by dialectal accent. And, and, and so and he was like, Mandy, you keep coming up with these ideas and you don't actually do anything with them. So could you actually do something with them? Or alternatively, could you stop talking about them? We could you just have lunch? <laughs> and that of course annoyed me. 
And so I went home and I bought the domain name. So anybody who likes careers in arbitration, if you ever meet David Phillips, buy him a drink. He likes red wine. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, have, have, a sound, have sounding boards, talk to people, sense check things and quadruple any estimate of time you think you're going to have to develop your initiative. But go for it. We like innovators. We like innovation in this field, as we all know. So do it. Well, my fear is standing in the way either. Absolutely. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. I like that. So just the wood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to the point is, yeah. if you're worried about people stealing your ideas, go to the people you trust. You, you all need to have people in your career that you trust who are going to be there to support you. They're not there to compete with you. And you all have them. And those are the people you brainstorm with. And those are the people who tell you when you're thinking of doing something crazy, or you're doing something that's risky, but worth doing. And, and if you have children, they are actually usually pretty good sounding boards for anything involving social media. I can attest to that. Um, so with that, uh, I think that concludes our panel. Thank you to Mandy, Rachel, Hahn. Also, you guys did a great job. Thanks so much for sharing these insights that you've learned over your careers. Perhaps we can invite you all to the cocktail we're having next door. Uh, on behalf of the three young institutions, we thank you very much. One more round of applause for this section.